Hi teachers, today we're going to talk about the Musette in D major from the notebook for Anna Magdalena Bach. This is such a fun piece. I'm sure you've taught it before and it's a really fun one to teach. So hopefully I have a few ideas for you that can help. I think the key feature of this piece and the reason that students love it is the ostinato bass, the jumping octaves. And I think that the composer, who was probably not Bach, my edition here says that we don't, it's an unknown composer. The composer titled it Musette and did the left hand that way because a Musette in the Baroque period was a bagpipe. So if you think about hearing bagpipes, there's always a drone, single note or single interval on the bottom. And then the more melodic or improvisatory music happens in the pipe or flute part of a bagpipe. Uh, this is on the RCM level three, and it's for my Illinois colleagues it's on the AIM level five. Great piece for an AIM exam. Today I'm looking at it in my Henley Urtext, but it does show up in many student collections, and I'll be sure to put some of those in a Sheet Music Plus link that will be in the description of this video. So what do our students need to be able to do in order to play this piece well? They need to be able to play in the key of D major with two sharps. And I would like for my students to know that in D, one and five, or tonic and dominant, are D and A. So much of this piece centers around those two chords, or two positions, or two harmony, whatever you want to call it, that I really want my students to know D and A are going to be what we're focusing on here, and it's a great review for tonic and dominant. Of course, to that end, the jumping left hand octaves on D and A, and then a little bit on E, uh, those are tricky, and they might be the first time that your student has really encountered this many octaves. They might have played another piece with a few octaves, um, but this might be more than they've done before. So you're going to want to have a conversation with your student about how they're going to do that. And I want my students to really freely bounce without trying to find the notes and sit on them, but just to bounce. And either it's, uh, you could use the analogy of a ping pong, just really bouncing back and forth. Or you can talk about wrist rotation. However you prefer to do it, the goal is to be free and bouncing and not sitting on the keys and, and trying to grip them. You know, and only play with the fingers. That would, that would not uh, be good for freedom of movement in this left hand part. The other big issue in this piece, of course, for students is the number of jumps and that you have to do the jumps hands together. So have your students done this? Of course, that's what you're going to have to train them on from the very beginning. So besides demonstrating this piece and talking about the left hand bouncing octaves and why it's called a musette, those jumps are the very first thing I would work on in a first lesson. And I would advocate for doing a little bit of rote teaching with this. It's such a memorable uh, tune at the beginning and the left hand is so simple that you want to get them looking at the keyboard right away to practice the jump. And so for me, I might start that with the outer, and you could just call it outside or out, the outer uh, D position and starting with my pinkies, five on A, five on D, and jumping to three on F sharp. So out and in. And the way I just practiced that was with a silent F sharp, which for some reason, playing a note and then jumping silently really confirms it for our, our brains and our coordination. You could also just play the F sharp. How quickly and how freely can I get there without trying to find the note first, but just jump right to it. Of course, then you'll have to practice the 16th notes at the end of measure two, getting into measure three without any delay in between those. And of course, you'll have to practice getting from measure four into measure five. So again, you can just practice from the inner D to the outer pinkies. But lots of practice on that and addressing that issue from the very first lesson will just nip it in the bud 
um, what students usually do, which is have massive hesitations on those bar lines. Uh, the other main problem spot in this piece is the end of the B section, measure 18, 19, 20. And I like to think about it as two A positions and make sure my students know that this part is simply in an A five finger pattern. And that right after that, pick up to 20, is similarly just in an A five finger pattern. If they're using really odd fingering or if they've gotten tangled up, I want them at the point of the pick up to 19 with the D to be in a position there. Otherwise, it's just gonna be a disaster in 19 and 20. So that would be another thing that I would address at the beginning. Maybe for the first week, I send my student home only with measures one through eight, but if they're able to handle more, I would start talking about how at the end of the B section, their right hand is gonna visually look like it's in A position and then jump to the lower A position and just kind of deal with that also from the very beginning. The B section is more complex and requires more reading. So if you use any of a rote approach on measures one through eight, your student is going to have to read more um, for measure nine through 20. Um, lots of accidentals in this part. And so that's just going to take more focus and attention and practice. Now you might have noticed I was using some two note slurs as I played that. In my Urtex edition here, I don't have any articulation. No staccatos, no slurs. If you're using a good student edition, you're likely to have articulation marked and you can de decide if you like it or if you don't. Bach didn't write it or whoever the composer was didn't write it. Bach didn't put it in his edition that he wrote for his wife. So um, if you have not already watched my lecture on Bach articulation for students, I will link that in the video description and encourage you to go there. But just to say, you could approach this piece with all of the 16th notes are generally connected or legato and everything else is detached so all the eighth notes detached. Or you could throw some two note slurs in there to highlight the important beats. And that's why I was doing that. The nice half steps. I like to put two note slurs in there. You can also put a two note slur at the downbeat of measure four. But that is a matter of choice and not something that I'm looking at on my page. Same goes for dynamics. The composer did not write any dynamics for us. I hear this as a really exciting and fun piece, so generally I would perform it at a pretty loud, strong dynamic with a lot of excitement, a lot of moving around. It's hard to play softer when you're moving quickly. So I think a little bit on the louder side is good for this. I also hear though in the B section that it comes down a little bit and then as the harmonic excitement builds and we go towards that resolution in A major, I hear that the dynamic might want to increase. So as you get to uh, measure 17, there's a bit of a crescendo and an arrival there before you then arrive back out. I hope this has given you a few ideas in teaching the musette in D major from the notebook for Anna Magdalena Bach. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and I wish you all the best in your teaching.